guys, uh, welcome to day three of reading the novel Sweep. I'm happy that I know some of you guys are starting to really follow along. And so uh, today we're going to go ahead and continue. Without further ado, we are on the chapter called Nan's Song. So if you recall what's been happening, basically we've just been meeting our characters. We have a girl named Nan who spent the last five years working alone as a chimney sweep. She's kind of living with some other orphans in a coal bin. Their situation is not great. We're finding out that the job of these kids who are chimney sweeps is basically to crawl through chimneys by themselves, cleaning out all the ash and soot. And if they get stuck, um, well, that's just too bad uh, and they could die. So uh, Nan is just kind of like living life. She's the best sweep in London, in her area in London. And so we're finding out more about that now. Nan tried not to think about Newt climbing into his first flu. The others had learned not to work chimneys with Roger, and now Newt would learn. She knew her best chance at getting something to eat would be to find a job near a wealthy home in the West End. The servants in nice homes could be counted on to give you a bit of food once you'd finished the job. She supposed she was a reminder of where most of them had come from, and seeing her made them grateful not to be her. The sun was just coming up now. The first fallen leaves of autumn were scattered across the dewy streets. All along the city, she could hear the chorus of climbers shouting their trade, sweep, sweep up, sweep for your soot. Of course, Nan had her own way of getting work. It was the way that the sweep had taught her. She saw a cluster of children on the steps of St. Paul's. They were all crowded around a filthy boy who had an enormous bag at his bare feet. Perched on his shoulder was a little white wrap with horrible red eyes. No pushing, gentlemen, said the boy in a loud voice. There's treasure enough for all. Whatever you need, Toby Squall's Emporium has just the thing. Does it have a kick in the backside? Nan muttered. The boy somehow heard her. He waved his cap, revealing a head of wild orange curls. Hello, Smudge. He was always calling her hat, her bat. She hated it even more than Cinderella. Can browse the Emporium? The Emporium was what Toby called his junk bag. It was rumored that Toby's bag was magical and bottomless. On any given day, he could be seen hawking buttons, candle ends, playing cards, string, pocket knives, snails, cutlery, eye patches, wishbones, and even once, a set of false teeth. He proudly described himself as an entrepreneur. Nan called him a pest. Toby Squall was a mudlark. He spent his days wading along the banks of the Thames, searching for rubbish and things that he could repair and sell. Most mudlarks found only junk. But Toby had an eye for treasure. If there was a good bootlace or hairpin in the river, you could bet that he would find it. I'm busy, Nan said. Just a peek, Toby clasped a hand to his heart. Everything's half price for my best girl. Toby was always calling Nan his best girl. He claimed to have loads of other girls, but Nan was his best. Go dunk your head, she said, walking more quickly. Her cheeks were burning, and she was grateful that they could not be seen beneath all the dirt. Nan and Toby had been having exchanges like this for the better part of five years. No matter what route Nan took each morning, Toby Squall somehow managed to be on the way. She cut up Bride Street to Farringdon Market. Girls and old women sold watercress and oranges and fresh oysters for a penny. Maids and butlers and servants rushed about on errands while their masters and mistresses slept late into the morning. The sweep had never understood how a person could sleep through the sunrise. It's like heaven itself is offering you a gift and you're too lazy to open it, he used to say. Then he'd wink and add, oh well, more for us. Nan stopped in the middle of the market. People flowed all around her like water around a stone. She closed her eyes and sang, with brush and pail and suit and song, a sweep brings luck all season long. When Nan sang like this, she could almost hear the sweep singing with her, his voice high and bright. She kept her hand in her pocket, clasped tight around the sweep's char, and almost felt as if she were holding his hand. Sometimes she thought that if she could sing loud enough, the sweep would hear her and would be drawn back to her by the song. As she sang, everything around her seemed to go quiet. Merchants and servants uh, lowered, slowed their pace. Even beggars raised themselves from the gutters. She knew every one of them was thinking the same thing. 
How could such a voice come from a person so filthy? Nan opened her eyes to find her first customer. It was a woman in a black dress with a pinched expression. Morning, ma'am, Nan said and tipped her top hat. It was much too large for her and she kept the inside stuffed with newspaper so that it wouldn't fall down and cover her eyes. The song was over, which meant the spell was broken. The woman now eyed Nan as though she might bite her. Who's your master, boy? Nan didn't bother correcting the woman about her being a girl. I work for Wilkie Crud. When Crud's name drew no response, she added, the clean sweep. The clean sweep? The woman's cheeks flushed red. Oh, I may have heard something about him. Nan was pretty sure that something had to do with him being handsome. The woman touched the back of her hair as if it were made of glass. Uh, will uh, uh, your uh, master be attending the task personally? Nan pretended to not understand what she was asking. I'll be doing the flues, mum, but the master always comes around to settle the bill and give a final inspection. She let this last bit hang in the air like a promise. Of course, the woman said, follow me. The woman led her up Holborn in Oxford Street. Nan glimpsed an abandoned mansion in Bloomsbury with more chimneys than she could count. The house was famous among climbers. They called it the House of 100 Chimneys. Everyone knew it was haunted. It was bad luck to even look at the place. The woman's heels clacked sharply against the wet sidewalk. Nan wondered what kind of house let the maid wear high boots. It didn't seem practical, but then rich folks never were. Nan's own feet were bare. Her soles were as hard as leather from years of climbing rough bricks. She didn't mind. Besides, in the wrong part of town, a pair of boots could get you killed. No one could steal what you didn't have. At last, they reached an imposing house in Marleybourne. Here we are, the woman said, removing her gloves. Nan looked up at the tall building, stone, not brick, with a flat front and many windows. No gables, no proper stoop, and far too few chimney stacks. Nan heard a pianoforte blasting or playing from one of the rooms on the second floor. A chorus of small voices sang along with it. How doth the little busy bee improve each shining hour and gather honey all the day from every opening flower? A few of the voices were pretty. All of them were eager. Nan listened to the singing and felt a nervous clench in her empty stomach. What kind of home do you keep? The woman feigned insult. I do not keep a home. This is Miss Mayhew's seminary for young ladies. When Nan didn't respond, she added, a seminary is a formal word for, I know what it means, Nan said. She adjusted her bag on her shoulder. Let's get on with it. Nan hated schools. They did not pay well, and the chimneys were always filthy on account of children burning all sorts of rubbish that they weren't supposed to. There were other reasons, too. The woman, who turned out to be something called a house mistress, took Nan around to the back to the servant's entrance. Nan followed her into the kitchen on the ground floor, which was where the main chimney began. The air was warm and steamy from what smelled like peace pudding. The cook eyed Nan with open dis disgust. Get that trash out of my kitchen before she blacks my biscuits. Nan silently gave up any hope of getting scraps. She made a point of letting the end of her brush rake along the wall as she passed, leaving a nice long streak of soot and on the plaster. The house mistress led Nan to an enormous fireplace in the back wall. It reeked of drippings and awful. It's this one here. The rest are upstairs, she said. The cook passed, pushed past Nan and collected some kippers that had been smoking above the fire. Keep them hands in your pockets. I've counted every morsel of food in the larder, and if I find even one bite missing, I'll reach into your mouth and pull it from your belly myself. Nan was eager to get to work and away from the smell of food. It was clear that the fire had been doused only moments before her arrival. The bricks radiated heat. She squeezed the char in her pocket for good luck. She removed her coat and top hat and closed her eyes. If you have never climbed inside of a chimney, perhaps you're wondering what it's like. Imagine holding an open book. Maybe you're holding one right now. Imagine a black tunnel that is exactly that size. 
an endless winding, winding tunnel with no light at the end. Imagine that the walls of that tunnel are sharp enough to cut your skin bloody. Imagine that some of the walls will crush you if you touch them wrong. Imagine some of the walls are on fire. Now imagine placing a cloth over your head. Take a deep breath if you still can and crawl inside. Nan reached the roof before the parish bells struck nine. She was shaky from hunger. From this height, she could see the clear to tower hamlets where she lived. She wondered where Newt was right now. She wondered if he'd made it safely through his first climb. What's the point if there, of seeing everything if there's no one to see it with? His question rang in her mind, louder than bells. She told herself it was better this way, leaving Newt with Roger. The boy needed to learn that he couldn't depend on anyone but himself. That was part of growing up. She reset the chimney cap and climbed down the drain pipe to collect the loose soot for her bag. By the end of the day, it would be as big as her. Soot was valuable to master sweeps, almost more than the fee they collected for cleaning chimneys. They sold it to farmers as fertilizer to make things grow. Nan always liked the idea that the soot she scraped might end up feeding an apple that she might one day buy in the market. She thought about eating apples. Then she tried to not think about eating apples. When the main stack was clear, Nan reported back to the house mistress who led her up to the first floor. The next fireplace is just this way, she said, leading down a hallway lined with doors. Mind you don't track any soot on the rugs. Nan heard the sharp tap, scritch tap of chalk against a slate board. A woman's voice spoke from behind a closed door. You will transcribe this poem in your finest hand along with the answer. Any girl who provides a correct answer will receive... Nan never learned what the girls might receive because that's when the house mistress opened the door. The room went instantly quiet. There must have been almost 20 girls in the classroom. All of them in pretty bows. All seated at wooden desks. All staring at her. This was the real reason that Nan hated schools. The students. Most ordinary folks tried to be polite and not stare. But school children do the opposite. They stare and stare and stare until you feel like there's nothing left inside of you. What is that? A girl in the front row whispered, plenty loud enough for everyone to hear. There were some nervous giggles from the others. Nan didn't say anything. She knew what she looked like. Every inch of her was caked in soot. Only her eye whites and teeth stood out from the mass of grime. She could have washed for a week, and you still would not know the color of her hair. The teacher was staring just like the rest. Ah, uh, it seems we have a guest, she said, not looking away from Nan. Forgive the interruption, Miss Bloom. The house mistress extracted a speck of lint from her sleeve. Uh, but this little fellow here will need to get through the chimney. Miss Mayhew ordered it done before the first frost. We'll need you and your girls out of here so as they don't get soot on their pinafores. Seems your little poetry lesson will have to wait. Nan got the sense that this woman was taking some pleasure in disrupting the class. The teacher, Miss Bloom, said nothing. She still had the chalk in her hand, suspended between thumb and forefinger. She'd been writing some sort of riddle on the, bo on the board. Feathers and bone, without and within, I am that and this and that once again. Born aloft among the winds, I encircle new life within my limbs. I bear the seed that bears the seed, and by spring's end, small mouths I'll feed. What am I? Nan read and reread the words, anything to avoid the staring eyes. The letters were long and elegant and perfectly formed. I shouldn't be long, your grace. She was unsure of how to address the teacher. Goodness, the woman stepped closer, peering at Nan as if she was some sort of curio. You're a little girl. Nan heard a sort of horrified gasp from a few, some of the students, but the teacher didn't look horrified. She looked concerned. Nan shifted her weight. She wanted to say something to the woman to show that she was more than a filthy climber. Her eyes returned to the riddle on the board. You have a 
Very pretty hand, she said. My letters are rubbish. This was true. Nan knew how to read, but writing was much more difficult. Mrs. Bloom, or Miss Bloom, looked from Nan to the blackboard and back again. You can read that? If the woman seemed surprised before, she now looked positively astonished. What sort of sweep are you? <laughs> A filthy one, someone muttered. Nan kept her eyes on the teacher. What am I? She tipped her hat. I am an egg. Without another word, she marched past the woman and set to work on the hearth. Some of the girls laughed at this strange response. Miss Bloom said nothing. Nan could not see the classroom, but if she could, she might have noticed the look on the teacher's face, a dazed expression and an open mouth, slowly forming into a smile. And we will continue more tomorrow. Have a great afternoon, guys.